So uh, Wednesday morning, uh, Hans Brown in his talk talked about Dr. Borlaug's mantra, and we've heard it again and again the last couple of days, take it to the farmers. And that's what this session is all about. He talked about the car analogy. He talked about the engine and the road it, it, um, it uh, is driving on. But I think what technology adoption, to continue that same metaphor, technology adoption by farmers is the really where the rubber hits the road. So uh, that's what we're going to be talking about. And I have to thank Rick and Gandhi for giving us just a terrific uh, platform from which to uh, step up to this topic. Um, as Hans said, he thinks about this in terms of one-third breeding, one-third agronomy, and one-third uh, policy. And I think the, the thing that I wanted to comment on in that very, I think, profound uh, but simple way of putting it is that we have to think about technologies in context, especially, especially when we're talking about smallholder farmers. And as we heard over and over for the last few days, those farmers are the ones that are most in need of our help, the rural poor, uh, whose livelihoods depend on agriculture and who are often those most affected by hunger and poverty. So it's a challenging uh, thing to do to, to look at technology in a systems context, but it's a very timely thing. Um, the head of USAID, my agency, is uh, Dr. Rajiv Shah. And Dr. Shah, if he were here, I can tell you he would be talking about the fact that while he loves research and he loves researchers, he likes even better the idea that the products of that research get into the hands of farmers. And he's impatient uh, for that to happen and, and is, I think, what has, he's raised on the global agenda right now is this idea of technology scaling. And we have that even in the G8 New Alliance in Africa, the New Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition, with a big focus on technology scaling. Um, we're not talking about turning researchers into extension agents. That's not what this session is about. It's about, it is about though, I think those of us in the research community being really mindful and strategically involved and in catalytic partnerships with people who are delivering technologies the technologies that are coming out of the research investments that you all are making. And I, the other point I would say here is that this is enlightened self-interest for those of us in research. It's the impact of your research when it's adopted by farmers that drives the feedback loop into more investment in R&D in the future. So we all have a stake in seeing this happen. Now we've got a terrific panel here this morning to, to help us think through this whole issue of technology uh, adoption, and they come from an array of backgrounds, uh, from science and national and international public organizations, from global development organizations, from a couple of really innovative national and regional initiatives, and finally from the private sector. So I hope we're going to have an array of insights uh, that will help us think holistically about this uh, challenge. Uh, we'll have about three minutes for each speaker. We're hoping that we can have some time for Q&As. We are short on time, but we will hope that uh, we can hear from you in the audience. Uh, so, and then at the end of the session, we'll give each speaker a chance to come back uh, and have a, a minute or two wrap up. So our first spe speaker is sitting to my left. This is Dr. Raj Paroda, a longtime friend. Uh, he is a plant breeder by background but he has led a very distinguished career as a Director General of the Indian Council on Agricultural Research, the Secretary to the Government of India. He has led the regional organization of APARI, that's the Asia and Pacific Agricultural NARS organization for a number of years now. He was the first chair of the Global Forum on Agricultural Research. He's been the chair of the ICRASAT board, and he's received a very, very high award from the President of India, the Padma Bhushan Award. Uh, he also now represents Asia on the CGIAR Fund Council. So Raj, uh, with pleasure, I turn it to you. Thank you, Rao. Uh, let us uh, first start with the first Green Revolution. The cradles of uh, Green Revolution had been at that time when I used to interact with Norman, mainly would define three. One is a partnership, partnership for technology generation 
and dissemination. The second, he would say that it is uh, people, people like him, Swaminathan and farmers of India. And third, policy, policy support for institutions, for creation of infrastructure and for providing technological inputs. Now, having come down 50 years from there, uh, once I asked Norman that uh, you have been working for last three decades in Africa, why we do not still have similar successes? And then he would say, these three Ps are very important and they are needed for any impact. Now, having said that, we also had uh, done at a global level exercise in the context of why we are not able to make similar impact. Because you seem to have done through miracle weeds and rices, but when you talk of the eco-regional and natural resource management research, then you will have to go for participatory approach, you will have to go out of your institutional boundaries, and you will have to work with farmers. So the messages came that a smallholder farmer must be given the main attention. The second, that from crop commodity, you must shift your research effort towards farming system. And third was that you must increase your investment and rather not only double, but triple. So the issue is that now today we want an impact. Impact from research and impact through new partnership. So the paradigm shift is that earlier it was the international centers and national research institutions, but now it is from the national uh, research and extension system. So from NARI to NARIS. And in that you have stakeholders, farmers, NGOs, CSOs, and uh, private sector. So we need to now have a new dimension in terms of how we work with them and whether there are innovation. This is another important point. So if there is innovation, you can focus your effort and it is in that context now, I would come to my last point that the, the change management has brought in the uh, concept of CGIR research program, CRPs. Even, so what you want is inter-institutional partnership, inter-regional cooperation, involvement of all stakeholders and change in the context of the donor's perception, whether it is the national donors or national government or the other donor organizations that you have to link technology with development and to see that research is for development. Thank you very much, Raj. I think, thank, I think that point about accountability is, is really running through all of our efforts these days, and I appreciate your highlighting it. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Wafa El Khoury. Wafa is a plant pathologist. Uh, she did her research and uh, education at the University of Gießen in Germany. Uh, she then worked at ICARDA for a number of years. She was a faculty, uh, university faculty in Lebanon. Uh, she then managed uh, one of the really major GEF UNDP projects on agricultural um, genetic resources, conservation, and use. Uh, she uh, worked with UI USAID in Lebanon. I hadn't realized that. We are worked for the same agency for a while. And uh, then she was at FAO where she was uh, one of the leaders of their plant protection work, uh, collaborating with CIMID, ICARDA, Cornell, and uh, the very importantly this week, the Borlaug Global Rust Initiative. So she knows this work well. Uh, in 2011, Wafa moved to uh, IFAD, where she is a senior technical advisor for agriculture. So Wafa, welcome and over to you. Thank you, thank you, Rob. Um, it's a pleasure that, to be here and to talk to you all and uh, meet old friends and colleagues. I, I work with, international, with the International Fund for Agricultural Development. That's a UN agency, but it's a financial institution. So we work, our mandate is basically <coughs> smallholder farmers and rural poverty. So it's not that we're working only on extension or, or uh, 
transfer of technology, whatever we might call it, but we're working really in all aspects of rural uh, poverty reduction. We've heard a lot of things to, in the past two days, three days, on what is needed from infrastructure to to uh, uh, markets, to extension, to knowledge. To So when we are working in that area, we have to cover every single item of that. However, today I just want to say that um, the way IFAD works is through uh, loans to governments. So all uh, mainly through loans to governments, but we also have some grants windows to link up to these loans. We do investment projects with the governments, led by the governments. Uh, IFAD supports these governments in, their, in the development of these projects through technical and the financial support, which, is, which are loans at different uh, interest rates. And then we have a window for the grants, which is used for innovations that feed into the loan projects. That means the grants that are given, whether to CG centers or to pharma organizations or to NGOs, that are grants for innovations where governments are not going to put their money, loan money, for, uh, for these innovations. But these innovations have to feed into an investment project which gives a great advantage to make these innovations available to farmers at a large scale. Our projects run between six and ten years, sometimes they are ex extended, and we cover 200,000, 500,000 farmers, depending on uh, beneficiaries, depending on the type of project and the country. So there's a great potential for really scaling up these innovations once they are proven and we know that they work and then we can streamline, mainstream them within our projects. I just want to say that um, we have different areas of, of, of uh, uh, intervention. Definitely the most vulnerable are for us the most important targets. Mainly these are the poorest of the poor but also the women and the indigenous people, as well as the young generations. And we know that there are huge, a very large amount of, of young people who are uh, in the rural areas who are poor and who have no employment. So that's an area of, of interest. And the very important thing that we are moving into uh, in the last years is the resilience, especially to climate change. And we have special grants for climate change resilience uh, to in add to our uh, projects and this has been mainstreamed as well as nutrition that has been mainstreamed. Uh, just to remind, just to, uh, to mention something is like extremely important in our business model is the, uh, is the um, ownership by the governments. So we don't, w the, the projects are, or gr programs are run by the governments, which means they own the design, they own the implementation, and they own the exit strategy. They own everything. We help them in, in developing the project, and we help them in maintaining um, uh, the, the development along uh, the implementation uh, uh, achievements. And at the end, we build their institutions so that when we leave, we make sure that the investments do go to the poor and our target uh, farmers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wafa. Uh, I have to say, it's, it's great to hear that an organization like EFAD is thinking in six to ten year time frames. So often, I think development agencies work in much shorter time frames that aren't really so realistic. The other thing I think that worth underscoring in your remarks is that EFAD has really aimed its efforts on the very poor, disadvantaged, farmers in marginal environments. So they've, they've really, I think, blazed the trail. And a lot of the, the literature on technology scaling is emanating from work at EFED. So it's great to have you as part of this discussion. OK, our next speaker is uh, Victor Lopez Salvedra. Uh, Victor, unlike our first two speakers, is not a scientist, which is good, because we know that technology adoption is not just about the science, so we need that other perspective. He comes out of a law and marketing and a commercial business management type background. 
He studied uh, on local economic development and project management. He's worked 10 years on public-private partnerships on things like international trade, agribusiness, sustainable development, and knowledge management, all really very relevant things in the discussion this morning. Uh, he's lived around the world, uh, worked with FAO and the Inter-American Development Bank, and uh, with CIMIT now re currently uh, as part of their global conservation agricultural program where he is providing uh, very important uh, leadership and participation in the Masagro program. So delighted to have you here, Victor. Thank you, Rob. Um, in fact, uh, I have the, the pleasure to, um, to represent a number of, of people working in, in the Global Conservation Agriculture Program of CIMIT. Uh, we have developed a strategy which is uh, called the Sustainable Intensification Strategy of, of the GICA program, which operates in different parts of the world. Uh, within this strategy of sustainable intensification in Latin America is that it grew the opportunity to work in Mexico on the Masagro project. So the Masagro project is, the, is a joint initiative by the Ministry of Agriculture of Mexico and CIMIT which intends to uh, work on, the, on raising the productivity of maize and wheat uh, production system in the whole country. So this, has, uh, this implies several challenges. Uh, first of all, we are working with, um, with two staple crops plus other uh, crops that can enter into rotation with these main ones. Um, and uh, we need to, uh, we understand that if we want to be successful uh, and we want to do a successful extension uh, delivery, we need to work with a lot of partners. That's why we, we need a very clear policy on how to stimulate partnerships, how to identify the suitable actors, and uh, we are also very careful with not replacing the private sector. That's something that Marianne Basinger, our research uh, director, was repeating yesterday, and I think it's key. Um, the program uh, has four components. Uh, some of them are more uh, scientific which are about uh, genotyping the mice and wheat varieties, understanding what is the potential of those. Then we have two strategies or two components to, to increase maize productivity and wheat productivity. And the fourth component is the take it to the farmer component. So then, then the challenge is to take this name outside and, and, and take the, the message of Borlo. Um, what I think we are doing is not only taking technology to the farmer, but is asking the farmer which technology would they need. So the process is a kind of a circular flow of information. Uh, we work through, through hubs. Uh, this is the way in which we, we, we deliver technologies. We kind of uh, revalidate the process all the time. Um, we base our work on conservation agriculture, on sustainable intensification techniques, on precision agriculture. Also our director of the GCAP was yesterday talking about precision agriculture. And we have several units which focus on, for instance, mechanization, on post-harvest handling, on strategic research, fertility, and so on. Um, we, uh, we also have a good, um, we have over 150 partnership agreements only in Mexico. Uh, we have partnerships with universities, companies of different sizes. Uh, for instance, we have a collaboration with the University of Chapingo to do a mapping of actors in the communities where we work. So, and this, is, uh, this, this has proved to be very interesting. We do uh, understand which are the innovation networks by identifying who are the, more, uh, the actors who are more open to change and who have more influence into their peers or into their customers. Uh, so we centralize our efforts with these actors. Um, so far we have reached, uh, in the program is a program of 10 years. We have finished the, year th the third year of the program and we have reached about 200,000 farmers. And the last year we, are, we were um, facing the, the challenge to go more into smallholder producers. The first two years of the project we started working with intermediate producers, with large producers, and we have different objectives for each of the categories, which go from the reduction of agricultural inputs, so saving harm to the, to the environment, to uh, making available um, improved seed varieties, 
and to uh, ensure food security and stabilize, stabilize in production, which is what we get to go to do with, with small producers. So, so far, we can say that the, um, the average of uh, improved productivity uh, on the farmers who have entered in contact with the project is about a 25% above the national average. So we consider that's a, that's a good uh, result. And finally, this, this 2013, we have, with our colleagues from the socioeconomics department, we have tried to identify which is the value of our program. And we have calculated that we have generated an additional income uh, in the farmers uh, of Mexico of 100 million in of US dollars in 2013 by improving productivity and reducing uh, cost of production. Yeah. Thank you very much, Victor. It's just a great story and I think an incredible opportunity for an institution like CIMIT to work with its host country, Mexico, to really step up to this whole array of challenges around sustainable intensification, but at all the levels that you mentioned, from large farmers to small farmers. So it's, I think there's so much opportunity to learn from country to country, and maybe that's some of the things that we will come to look into when we get to the discussion. So our next speaker is, um, I would say he's very modest, because uh, his bio is, he is Jean Fremont, he is a member and secretary of the board of the Sasakawa Ac Africa Fund for Extension and Education. And I have to say that I'm, this is a direct legacy of Dr. Borlaug. And, and so it's, uh, and it's, it goes back now, I think, 20 years, Sean. I know you're going to tell us about this, but welcome. And uh, we're excited to hear how that effort is going. Thank you, Rob. Let's illustrate uh, what take it to the farmer means through the story of uh, the Sasakawa Africa Association, a brainchild of uh, norm um, to which the uh, President Carter was associated. In a nutshell, July 1985, Ryoshi Sasakawa, head of a Japanese foundation, put a couple of millions of dollars on the table and tell Norm, you do it. You transfer the technology to the farmer. Um, give a chance to them to increase the production. No request, no log frame. The decision is taken in three days. The time of the conference. And I compare this to the three years it took later on to SAA to reach an agreement with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Still in 1985, in Atlanta, a meeting chaired by President Carter with Norman Bolo. Norman Bolo asking Winkelmann, Director General of CIMIT, what have you developed in the Yaqui Valley and tested successfully in Africa? which can be transferred to a small farmers, and where. Countries came up, Ghana, Sudan, Tanzania. And a couple of weeks later, Bola, Carter, and Sosakawa were on a plane visiting the heads of state. And the message was very simple. Let's work together to transfer what has been done, research in Mexico or in India with Icrisat to the small farmers. But are, there are conditions, and one of the conditions put your pricing policy right. A couple of months later, mid-1986, mid the MOU was signed, Carter Ball on one side, the Minister of Agriculture of two countries, Ghana and Sudan on the other side, and the program was in place. Uh, this is a story of partnership building norms way. The partners, very simply, the Ministry of Agriculture and, at the core, the extension workers. They are the ones who, through demonstration, will carry the message. And the success comes immediately. And I think all of you who have done uh, this transfer of technology to the farmers, if it's a proper technology, if it's adopted, the success is immediate. 
by the way, then comes the problems. Uh, what is striking? The speed, the simplicity, the focus, a no-nonsense approach based on a very broad vision with one single priority, the farmer, no one else. Nothing deviate norm. Uh, he, he was not politically correct because he was not a coward. He always stood up and spoke. To Bono, extension workers are sent to stage when it comes to take it to the farmers. And thus, they have to be promoted and trained. And this is at the origin of a second partnership with African universities uh, across Africa uh, through a sister organization called the Sasakawa Africa Fund for extension education, launched more or less at the time when the World Bank was very active dismantling the public extension in Africa, something to which today in many countries, agricultural development pay a very heavy tribute. The strength of those Norman Bolloy and Spy partnership, clear and concrete purposes, very little paperwork, trust, no time to patch ego, leadership. Partnership is not seen as a science, but as a tool to join force in which everyone has a role and should be respected. Even the farmers, because the farmers in the end are part of the partnership. Today, SA follow the same path, partnership with ministries of agriculture, extension, and universities are central. But other partnerships have been uh, created. The approach is the same as much as possible. Simplicity, uh, focus, improving the capacity to take it to the farmers. Now, Bola and President Carter are indeed exceptional personality, and does it mean that only exceptional personalities can do partnership VSA way? Uh, to some extent, yes. But I strongly believe that all of us can contribute to take it to the farmer through partnerships uh, of the same kind. But they have to be simple. Uh, they have always to think of farmers and their families as human beings and not as experimental uh, uh, end of, of a process. Um, not as food producer only. We heard before that doing agriculture should not be emotion free. Indeed, it requires passion. Science is important, but and I think this is Norm's main message. It is nothing if the scientists do not remember his humanity. Thank you very much, uh, Philippe. I mean, Sean, excuse me. Um, Right implicit in all of the discussions we've been hearing uh, is the issue of markets and sustainability in terms of farmers adopting technologies that are economically advantageous to them. And, and so I think it's very fitting that we now have our next speaker, uh, Dr. Philippe Hervé. Philippe is vice president and head of R&D, Research and Development, Alliance at Bayer Crop Science. Uh, he leads a global team uh, in charge of partnerships, so also a, a very key aspect, uh, one of the P's that Dr. Perota mentioned at the, at the beginning. Uh, he is a chemist and, and biologist by background, and he works in partnerships that license R&D across things like crop protection, seeds, and biologicals, which we've heard about earlier this morning, all the exciting things that are happening there. And he's worked across Europe, Africa, and Asia. So Philippe, we're very grateful, and, and um, in, a way, in a way I feel a little sheepish putting the burden of representing the whole private sector uh, on you, but uh, we really, we need that perspective, so thank you for joining us. Thank you, and, and I just arrived this morning, unfortunately, so I missed uh, two previous days, but, but I was happy to make this extra mile of uh, a few, like uh, 18 hours to make it today. Um, maybe give you a perspective on, on biocrop sounds quickly. So we are the largest pro technology provider for wheat 
in the field of crop protection. And, and we are today uh, building uh, tech to, to be a technology provider for seeds, because you heard, you heard before, it's very important that we provide to farmers. And I, and I really like what you say, Jean. Now the farmers is the main partner in the whole equation. But we want, like the whole industry has realized, we need to bring all integrated solutions to the wheat farming community, uh, like we have done for maize. And because we did it successfully for maize, we have done it quite successfully in rice. We will do it successfully in, in wheat without uh, any doubt. Now, the, the question we have in the private sector when it comes to wheat, and we always have the same question, is how profitable, how profitable is the wheat farming? Because a farmer is, above all, a business person. It's a business person who has also to take care of a family, to send kids, uh, to schools and so on and so on to take care of health. And so the decisions that Rob Frawley mentioned, decision on when and on what to invest, is a daily decision of farmers. And when you think about technology, uh, you have to first to think about how profitable uh, for farming is the technology you are bringing to, to the equation. So if you bring a very expensive technology today in the wheat farming community, it's, uh, it's going to be difficult because uh, the wheat uh, farming is not profitable enough. Uh, it's not like corn. So for us, that's really what we bring uh, into the equation is, is how to, to upstream, capture the insight from all the other organizations and with the farmer to select uh, quickly enough uh, the technologies that we think will be adopted because solving the problem and being affordable and being uh, easy to adopt in terms of convenience. We should always uh, keep in mind that farmers, because they have a family and other occupations, uh, they go for the easiest technology in terms of application. So if you bring a technology for 20 times a sprayable application versus a solution that is already embedded in the seeds, uh, it's, it's easy for the farmer. So understanding the, the farmer insight has been uh, uh, too often neglected. And now we are really in the private sector, I think, completely changing the way we partner to capture the, the farmer insight directly from the farmer or from other organizations, extension services, NGOs, and so on. Uh, thank you very much, Philippe. I, I think that you really underscored the point that uh, Jean was making, this idea of farmers as partners. Uh, and also, I think, I'm guessing that the issues of ease of adoption, affordability, and such run right across the, the panel's thinking. So uh, we'd like to open it up now uh, for some questions and answers. I think it looks like all the mics are up here, but if you come up front, maybe we can, or maybe somebody can help with the, the, the microphone. Do we have any? <laughs> can you come up and, and make, make your question? Thank you. Yeah, we can just, if somebody, that would be great. Thank you very much. To Dr. Raj Paroda. Uh, Dr. Raj Paroda represents Asia on the Fund Council of CGR. Uh, CGR has been going through a lot of, uh, you know, transformation recently. Uh, I find there's a serious disconnect between the national systems and the CGR system. Uh, the new CRPs and all these things are not well understood in the NARS and by the policymakers. How CGR would really interact with the NARS system and develop partnerships to bring home uh, to the national research and extension systems uh, the benefit of all the new uh, reshuffling that is taking place, the new concepts that are being developed, and how to remove this disconnect, please. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Perota, would you care to comment on that? Uh, I think uh, this is the most important challenge for which uh, the entire change management process is uh, now oriented towards. We need reorientation and we need new partnership 
and strengthen the partnership with national agricultural research systems and in that process involve the regional fora, farmers, par private sector and also the CG system. So CRPs have, first thing, the objective is that you need to now work for a specific natural resource management research which is eco-regional and in partnership with all stakeholders because that is what is very critical. And you need to have innovation, not only research for research. And in that process, effort is to involve more of stakeholders. And the process is still on. The CRPs still not have completed more than two and two and a half years. So the effort now is how do you bring in more partnership? And in that respect, how you see that there are innovation which can have impact and by which farmer can reduce the cost on their input, have input efficiency and link themselves to the market for more income. So these are the areas which are getting focused both by the CG through SRF, that strategic partnership framework or research framework and then also by GCAR through GCAR road. These are the challenges which we have to address even at national level ourselves. Like Naris have to be converted or changed into Naris, which means involving everyone in the decision process, in the implementation process. So I would not like to dwell more on this, but this is the biggest challenge. How do you bring in partnership? Farmer first, then Farmer must be involved in the decision making, also should be equivalent partner for technology generation, whether innovation is farmer led or science led, this has to be given due emphasis and in the process we have to see how we translate these results for greater impact. Thank you, Dr. Perota. It strikes me that the, the challenge that the questioner put on the floor is, is, is a real challenge because it's, there's both a, a focused approach that Dr. Perota has referred to, but there's also this huge diffuse set of partnerships that we've been hearing about. And, and all of those really add, you know, they, they serve the goal that you're interested in, but it, it, it is an ongoing effort that, that needs to be emphasized. Sir, you had a question. Yeah, this is not a question, but uh, uh, I would like to share. Uh, a, a success story of Indian Agricultural Research Institute, New Delhi, uh, successful partnership with NGOs with uh, a proven track record and uh, good intentions of uh, disseminating new IRI wheat varieties through uh, demonstrations, uh, well-planned demonstrations. And uh, to have a feel for that, uh, uh, I would urge you all to have a look at our poster number 105. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I like the word when you say that take it to the farmer and take it in a simple way. I think technology can be taken to the farmer, either variety or any recommendation of crop management. But I think small farmer mainly needs another things, they need other services. I mean, um, inputs, how we can deliver inputs to that in a reasonable price uh, mainly for the poor or small farmers. Uh, also, the, the marketing mechanism, the market me marketing mechanism is an important thing and issue. Uh, also, the value chain, I think Dr. Wafa has to respond to that, if you like, concerning the value chain of the um, mandated crop or whatever. Can I ask uh, anyone on the panel? Want to Wafa, you want to start? And then I think maybe our colleague. Just have a, <clears throat> I'm, I'm responding on behalf of the smallholder farmers. And based on our experience, there's a, I mean, um, there are many things that the farmers are lacking. And these are especially those that are in the remote areas where the private sector doesn't have an incentive to go. It's too much for it. So, the, there's, a, there's a basic problem. These are issues like input, supply, markets, where they don't, they don't have the access, but also financial support. 
uh, I mean, Rami, what I mean is rural finance uh, uh, credits and savings and so on, because small differences for the smallholder farmers make a big, small, uh, small changes make a big difference. So our, in IFAD's projects, usually, we, this is part of the partnership, because the, the, the private sector is not interested. What we try to do is give the private sector that um, critical mass of farmers that are organized one way or the other to have a market there so that they can have the interest from going there. Sometimes in the, in the rural finance uh, perspective, we have incentives in various ways, which is not directly uh, a subsidy, but it's, a, it's an incentive that can promote um, uh, rural finance institutions to go out, out of their way, create new markets and new products for these smallholder farmers so that they can buy seeds, so that they can buy inputs, so that they can uh, get certain access to post-harvest uh, uh, technology. So we, from our perspective, this is what, how we can help and broker that relationship between the private sector and the smallholder farmers. Thank you. Two or three points um, based on your remark. First of all, I heard someone, I think it was the first day, speaking about uh, Norm being a value chain person. I don't believe so. Uh, Norm was very much uh, a scientist, agronomist, fascinated by the plants. He didn't like too much economists. He didn't like too much agroeconomics. And uh, therefore, he was a pushman from input to the farmers. We now have moved, I think, to something which is very solid, which is uh, the concept of value chain, which is a pull system. And at SAA, we have uh, clearly uh, gone into an overall approach. And to the extent that we have developed with the universities new extension, uh, extension workers uh, curriculum, which are uh, taking into account or teaching the value chain approach, including the marketing approach to the extension people, so that the extension people can work with the farmers in doing what is absolutely central, this kind of commercialization of the farmers, with which there will be no uh, development of a modern economy. So that is, is, is a very ma major thing. The second thing I think which is very important is that it was said here, we have to get rid of this public and private sector dichotomy. We all on the same boat. We have all different responsibilities and we have to understand each other. There is no, on one side, the good people and the bad people. We are all on the same boat with a major responsibility. Yes, the world has become more complex, but we have to do it and, and not be uh, overwhelmed by the complexity. And uh, I think here again, Norm shows the way. Yes, yes, I think, I think this, this fits a lot on, on what Masagro is, uh, is doing. And uh, I would like to highlight three areas where we have intervention. One is information. What we do is to give farmers the, the information they need to take better decisions. It can be a uh, forecast of their production. It can be market price in real time through uh, ITC. For instance, we have uh, a system of information through mobile, which is called Masagro Mobile. Uh, the other one is the diversification. So we, lead, we, we help them to understand what could be a business strategy for, for the selling of their products. That's why we promote the rotation of crops, not only from an agronomic point of view, which is uh, better for the soil and is better for the pest control, but also to find market opportunities. And we, from, from CIMIT, as facilitators of the process, we work with different actors of the value chain to understand which are uh, advisable recommendations in terms of diversification. And then the third leg will be technology. So uh, it, it's not uh, useful if you know that you would like to sell your grain when, it's, uh, to, uh, when, it's, um, when there is a higher price in the market, if you, for instance, cannot uh, storage it properly. So we also take care of this thing. We, 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 pro we promote uh, hermetic storage solutions, for instance. 
it's okay. It's okay. Well, I think it's a very important point because that's a problem in wheat. Um, the pricing of the of the commodity is pretty low, and so the farmer's income is pretty low. So how can farmer afford technologies that have a high price? And then companies, private sector, will not invest their R&D money if they cannot price the technology properly. So, and we have heard when you do a technology push, and we need to do technology push, maybe in wheat that will be a hybrid wheat, that may be GM technology. Those will be technology push, but coming from other crops, that, that will certainly happen. Um, but it, has, it, it comes with, with time. All we heard about RNAi, Rob Frale mentioned, you know, that's a 15 years st uh, journey so far, and it, the private sector is patient in a way because we are trying to reduce the price of the technology to its right level. But we will never bring, as a private sector, we don't think it's good to bring a technology at a price that is too low. Because again, we should not forget, farmers are business people. So they, they like to get uh, a technology at the right price because if you price too low, maybe your technology is not that good. That's, that's why it's cheap technology. So we should always put ourselves in the, in, the, in, the, in the shoes of the farmers. Of course, for uh, small older farmers, it's, it's different. Um, but again, as a private sector, our aim is to get a better pricing of the commodity. And that's more than the farmers, that's consumers, that's, that's the entire society. Do we price properly uh, wheat, for example, for, for in our food system? One point is very important in this respect that farmers firstly need knowledge and uh, also they need uh, to be strengthened through capacity development and specifically in the context of women and youth's involvement so that there is diversified agriculture and they would need investment so linking them to bankable projects providing them vocational training to go in for secondary agriculture because youth otherwise is not getting attracted to agriculture in present time so and the role of women is also important for household nutrition security so they have to be empowered in this whole process, either self-help group, cooperatives, or producer companies, new or contract farming are the various options which need to be promoted. Thank you. So we are about out of time, but there is someone there and someone there who have been waiting. So could you make your question very quick, and then we'll take your question, and then we'll give the panel one last. Well, okay. Um, thank you very much for the floor. Um, my question is um, about the connection between the extension system and the research system. Yeah, yeah. Well, perhaps this should not have been the last, one of the last questions, but uh, I'd like to see a kind of view of one of the panelists on this. How, how can we assess the level of uh, collaboration and partnership between the research uh, system, uh, an extension system at, at country level. It's a great Thank question. Uh, my, Madam? Yeah, hello. My question is that uh, how this industry really could work, whatever has been shown in the morning, uh, reaching to farmers or awareness programs, is that you have a technology, you have a variety with this specific trait, whether it's barley or wheat or any other crop, but then going with the contract farming system, I think nobody discussed about it, where we require actually the intervention or mobilization of the small industries. Like I have a variety with good spread factor for biscuit making. Is industry come forward, work with the farmers so that directly with the farmers, the scientists is there as well as industry is there and then through contract farming, some benefit goes to the farmers. So there are certain issues still, you know, we need to work on. Yeah, thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, Philippe, please. And Maybe make this the last comment. We'll just go down the line. So on the extension services, well, I've done it myself. So, uh, you know, when you go to the field, the first thing you ask is your, is your sales team, you know, you visit farmers. Key, as a private sector, you invite the extension service officer with you. So they, together, you listen to the farmers. And, and what I learned is that the extension services uh, if you engage them when you do those kind of 
consultation with farmers or when you invite farmers, if they are present, they also better understand the kind of technology you are bringing. And, and, they, and it's very important also to listen to how they perceive those new technology, especially for the new technology, how they perceive uh, how an adoption by farmers locally can happen. And because otherwise, if you try to, from a private sector to push, usually extension services will push back. <laughs> so very upstream, you involve them. Uh, and, and, and if you listen, I mean, it's all about listening, uh, because they are there to help the farmers, and they are advisor. Uh, then you have a better chance to get their buy-in. And for me, it's very important to have the buy-in of extension services. It's key. How to assess is always a, a difficulty, but I would say from our experience, um, you know, we, we live in a network of, of partnerships, all kind of partnerships, and I could uh, give many, many examples of a, a partnership. For example, I'm thinking of one in Mali between us, the, uh, the, institute, the, the National Institute of Research, and uh, the, the, the local antenna of ICRISAT. Um, uh, there are other, in other countries, it's uh, IRTA. Uh, it's very much the local branch or the regional branch of the, of the international centers which we involve, and including also uh, very systematically the, uh, the National Institute and a lot of our team, because all our national teams are national teams. Um, and uh, we have a lot of people coming from the research institute uh, the National Research Institute. So it is taking place. Now, how to evaluate that is another story. Okay. Um, on the relationship between extensionists and researchers, I would like to, to point out that uh, for, uh, in our conception, extensionists are not selling agents. So they cannot work, they, the flow of information cannot work one way only. There is always have to be this uh, understanding of what uh, what are the needs and um, in our program we also involve farmers so that they become extensionists themselves and that is the best way to understand what they need because they want I mean they will give you feedback in real time about what what is happening in the field um, and as, as a closure remark I would like to to propose to researchers in general to to take one step further to take it to the farmer and uh, so that we can work on uh, take, take, take it uh, from the farmer, take uh, the innovation needs from the farmer and uh, deliver it for the farmer. Okay, so th this will be my message. Uh, and then the second message for, for researchers is that it's not enough with developing a technology, with, uh, with having something that works uh, perfectly on, on your lab. You have to make it available and uh, that is something that sometimes is not well, well pursued. Uh, we at Masago are developing agreements with local blacksmiths so that they learn, they manufacture the technologies that we produce. And, and, and we do this at a very local level, and I think that's the way to, to, to do, just uh, that the technologies arrive to the, um, to the roots. And then last, last message is that we have a a booth, uh, a stand of information outside of, of Masagro, and uh, we can explain there with more detail. Thank you. Um, my last comment is that there's not one size fits all, and I think, especially with extension, we're moving into the pluralistic extension, and there's every country and every region and every system has its own strengths and, and weaknesses. So we have to be flexible about that in the sense that we can have you know, the participatory type of farmer to farmer and participatory type of extension. We can have the contract farming in certain con uh, cases where the private sector is providing extension. We can have um, this traditional conventional extension service. We have to deal with it as it comes in every context. And, um, and, and we should not shy from the pluralistic within the same uh, extension t uh, systems within the same country. And one last thing is, it has been mentioned before, and it, it 
cannot be underestimated the policy. And that is a very important thing also for the extension uh, research interaction. Because very often you have institutional barriers or uh, uh, that, that, that hinder that interaction. So I think we should take care of that. Regarding linkage between research and extension, one thing is very critical that we need to now go for innovative ways for extension approach. That earlier government oriented extension would not function and here we would require role of all stakeholders and therefore coordination and convergence becomes an important issue. Farmer needs knowledge, the knowledge should be disseminated in time and we have to build his capability but uh, dissemination losses while transferring any innovation or likely to have impact of innovation would be more counterproductive if proper knowledge is not provided. So in the process we should look for what are the other ways like ICT was talked by green, uh, digital green or even many countries, even in India, I still don't have one dedicated channel for agriculture on TV and seeing is believing. So you would require to think that when you have hundreds of channels for other, uh, you know, uh, activities to be covered, why not in agriculture? And farmer would, is craving for better knowledge. It's not that he is not willing to adopt. The, the last point I want to say is that earlier miracle weeds were, I think Borlaug was very fortunate because those weeds everyone wanted, that we needed food and they were input oriented technologies. But now you need technologies where you need to reduce on input cost and you have to link yourself to market for more income. So. Here you will have to go for natural resource management approaches and there we will need more patience and we will need better competent extension people. We will need partnership with private sector, also with NGOs, so that knowledge in right context, whether it is conservation agriculture, whether it is diversified agriculture, whether it is relating to farming system, will be required and that would need innovative ways for future extension approaches. Thank you, Dr. Perota. I think that last point is really was brought out by Rob Fraley this morning when he talked about the efficiency of production, how production, productivity is going up, but it's also becoming relatively cheaper to get that yield for the farmer and for the environment, very importantly. So I think we heard that it's all about partnership, that the farmers are at the center of that partnership, that there's a two-way flow of information with the farmers as partners, that we can't succeed if we have a public-private dichotomy. We have to be, we're all in this together, we're working together. That policy is critical. You know, that's that, that's that piece that Hans talked about, his car on the road, but we need gas stations, we need uh, re repair places, and I think the policy has to enable all of that. And that, uh, of course, is really essential, I think, for private sector investment on the one hand and for farmers' market access and profitability on the other. So please join me. Thank you for staying, and please join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>